Hi, I'm Dario Cortez. Berkeley College believes that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect our daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and the partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Wells Fargo, the law firm of Gibbons PC, PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities, Verizon Communications, and by Cohn Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger, powering NJ.com. And by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. It's my honor, my pleasure to introduce a guy who's been with us many times. He is uh, Joe Roth. He's the president and chief executive officer of the New Jersey Sharing Network. Good to see you, Joe. Hi, Steve. We've been talking about uh, tissue and organ donation for a long time. Yes, we Describe have. the issue, the challenge we face today, and uh, the opportunities to make progress tomorrow. Well, there, there are so many people still who are suffering from end-stage organ failure, and the only way to uh, treat that and save their lives is uh, organ transplant at the moment. And the way we uh, derive the organs for the transplant is through somebody passing away in a tragic accident. And there's just not enough of those events happening and people consenting to donation to meet the need that's out there right now. There are 5,000 people in New Jersey, 110,000 people approximately in the country currently waiting? Correct. Correct. And 18 for, people died. Go ahead. Oh. It's just waiting for what? Well, they're waiting for kidneys, for livers, for hearts, for lungs, uh, pancreas, pancreas uh, large intestines. Those are the organs that are transplantable right now um, uh, to save lives. And those are the people who, with ends, you know, if their, their heart's failing or their lungs aren't working, kidneys are failing, they can't survive any other way than to get a, a transplant. How long are they waiting, John? Well, in New Jersey, specifically for kidneys, some wait as long as five years for a kidney. It's, it takes that long for them to move up the list uh, and find a kidney that's compatible for them. What stands in the way of that wait? Well, first of all, why is it that long? I'm curious about that. Uh, well, because the process requires a, a, a very specific matching of the organ to the recipient. Uh, it's a genetic matching, and so um, it takes a while to find that. But there are a lot of people suffering from kidney failure. Uh, the, the, you know, diabetes, uh, hypertension are rampant in, in this community, and the baby boomers are now pushing through that cohort, uh, are, are suffering from these diseases, and now need the treatment necessary. For the, the Talk about your organization and the, the role it's playing in trying to deal with the right. really the, the the terrible situation you just described. Well, the Sharing Network is a federally designated organ procurement organization. Our service area is most of the state of New Jersey, and we're affiliated with all the transplant centers in New Jersey. Uh, we service 54 hospitals in New Jersey that are affiliated with us that provide us potential organ donors. And our job is to identify those potential donors, send staff on site to evaluate. And, and then, if necessary, approach the families for consent or identify whether the donor has designated their willingness to be a donor to begin with, either through the Motor Vehicle Commission on their driver's license mm. or through a um, deed of uh, document of gift or an advanced directive. Uh, so, so play this out, Joe. So I mean, we've been talking about this issue for a long time. Um, at the Caucus Educational Corporation, our educational production company, we made a decision a long time ago that we would try to increase awareness, and also increase the number of people who, in yes. fact, make this decision Absolutely. to do this. Um, question, how do people, if they want to, um, donate the organs, how would they do that? The easiest way is, if you have a driver's license, is to indicate it on your driver's license. When you go to register for your or renew your license, the people at the Motor Vehicle Commission Agency are required to ask you if you wish the words organ donor on your driver's license. Where, it's right there. Right. On the front, it says organ donor. That's a consent for organ donation. Stay on that for a second, Joe. <clears throat> of the driver's licenses that people get driver's licenses right. in the state of New Jersey, what percent 
of those licenses are marked off, hey, I'm in. Right now, it's uh, less than 35%. It's um, less than 35%. Less than 35%. Uh, we were a little slow to the table to have this process enacted into law. Other states are a little ahead of us. And we are working very closely with the Motor Vehicle Commission and the governor's office uh, to educate the public to say, say yes when they ask you uh, to put, your, put organ donor on your driver's license. Less than one-tenth of one percent of the people who indicate their wish to do donate ever become organ donors. So it's not an automatic situation that if you say yes to organ donation, <clears throat> you'll be a donor. But when you show up in the hospital and it's already there, uh, it makes it so much easier on the family who are already in crisis because you suffered a severe injury. They know now that's your wish to donate and it makes it, the, the process a lot more comfortable for the family. So here, here's my question. The number's at 35% on the driver's license right now of people right. who say, yes, I'm in, I want right. to be an organ donor. The reason that it's not, there are a lot of reasons why that is not higher, but one of them is the common misconceptions about organ donation, which include the biggest, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, well, one is, uh, you know, that uh, the doctors won't treat me aggressively enough when I come to the hospital if they know that I'm going to be an organ donor. That never happens, it never has happened. The fact of the matter is the doctors don't even know that you're going to be an organ donor when you show up in the hospital. They have no idea. They have no idea. Their job is to save the patient, and they do that. The doctors who work uh, t you know, who, who are the ones who then finally make the decision that the patient has a non-survivable injury don't know usually that you're going to be an organ donor either, but they have to make that decision and pronounce the patient uh, in, you know, dead, basically. That's one. What about the religious piece? Well, the, again, there's been a misconception that it goes against many religions. Most religions uh, uh, have no prohibition against donation. Most religions look at it as a charitable act. And so that's a misconception. And then there's some of the old urban legends about you know, going to a bar and the next thing showing up in a bathtub full of ice with a slice mm -hmm. in your flank and your kidneys are gone. Again, that's never happened. So <laughs> that's part of the process that we have to deal with every so often when we talk to people. But Joe, in terms of the, the, the idea of who gets access to these organs, uh, someone's got access, someone's got money, someone's got influence, go. Again, not true. Uh, there is a process in this country where there are allocation policies that are set up. Allocation by policies? Policies on how people are, are allocated that organ. And it's based on sickest first and length of time on the waiting list. So as you get sicker with your disease, you move up the list. If you get better, you move down the list. It's a dynamic process so that the sickest get transplanted first. So an organ in New Jersey, someone happens to pass in New Jersey car accident, whatever mm -hmm. it is, that organ doesn't necessarily stay in New Jersey? Not necessarily. It goes where? Well, again, it, the first look is in New Jersey. If there is a patient, the first look is in New Jersey. If there's a patient on the list that qualifies for it, they'll get it offered first. But if there's somebody much sicker who mm -hmm. are outside of New Jersey, then we may have to move that organ to that other state where that recipient is. We just, uh, as you uh, came but in But it goes here. the other way, too, you should know. What do you mean? I mean, organs come into New Jersey for sick people from other states, so yeah. it, it's a two-way street. Give you 30 seconds before you get out of here, Joe. Make the case for those watching, saying, hey, this guy's interesting. I'm curious about this topic, but I, I don't know. I don't know if it's me. 30 seconds, make the case. Well, for starters, uh, again, as I said, less than one-tenth of one percent of the people who, who indicate they want to be organ donors become organ donors. But to know that if your family knows that you want to be an organ donor, it makes life much easier. You can't take your organs with you. Why not, you, why not help somebody who can benefit from that? And bottom line is there are people dying. 18 people a day are dying because there aren't enough organs to go around. Our job is to eliminate deaths on the wait list. It's, it's a fair process. It's a righteous process. It's something that people should do as a matter of charitable course. So, Joe Roth, New Jersey Sharing Network. I'm glad to be your partner. Let's keep working together. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks, buddy. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you, Joe. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at caucusnj.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. Susan F. Hall is the CEO of the Boys and Girls Clubs in New Jersey. Good to see you, Susan. Thank you. Um, for those who do not know, the Boys and Girls Clubs is? The Boys and Girls Clubs is an after-school, out-of-school time programming 
um, for youth ages 5 to 18 that participate in our programs. How did you get hooked up with this whole operation? Um, I really been working with youth for a long time and had the opportunity to come over to New Jersey and uh, do something for boys and girls. Mm. Uh, primarily I was working with girls and I really thought it was important to um, have the boys be focused on just as much as the girls. And the interesting thing here is that um, well, we've had a long history working with the Boys and Girls Clubs. Connie Ludwin, yes, your predecessor, yes. we, you know, she's terrific and Incredible. we're excited about your uh, tenure as well. It's this new initiative, the Super Bowl in New Jersey, it's a big deal. Um, whether the show airs before or after, it's still a big deal. They created something called, the Super Bowl host committee created something called the Snowflake Youth Foundation. What is it and what's its connection to the Boys and Girls Clubs in New Jersey? The Snowflake Youth Foundation was formed to uh, provide support for youth development organizations. Uh, Boys and Girls Clubs in New Jersey was very fortunate that the NFL had chosen the Boys and Girls Clubs to be our, the lead charity. So the Snowflake Foundation is raising funds on behalf of the NFL to support infrastructure programs. What does that mean? Break it down. Where's that money going? The money's going to the clubs. Uh, the money's going to the clubs. It's, um, it, it was a, started out as a big initiative, and um, they wanted to fund about 12 clubs. Um, so far to date, they funded about seven clubs. Um, all infrastructure in, uh, initiatives. Fixing that, gyms, fixing pools, gyms, what? Fixing gyms, pools, um, uh, wet back systems. I mean, they're doing the, the, the important stuff that programmatically you need to have run operating to run programs, but it's very hard to raise funds for unrestricted dollars to get some of these maintenance projects Describe that done. for folks, for, for people who really don't, don't understand. Unrestricted dollars, Un what does that mean? Unrestricted dollars are dollars that are donated that can be used for the discretion of the clubs. So if they have a bathroom that needs to be fixed, if the air conditioning break breaks, those are the funds that would go to support those. And those are critical. Uh, people don't realize that, you know, in order for these programs to operate, they have to have a safe building. And um, a lot of our clubs are older, and maintenance on them is costly, but is very much needed. How did you get into not just the Boys and Girls Clubs, but the whole idea of youth development? Uh, I think it started for me at a very young age. Um, I was you grow up? born and raised in Patterson, New Jersey. Patterson? Patterson, yes. And um, was always involved in volunteering, um, giving back. Um, I really enjoyed myself as a youth. I had great opportunities that were offered to me. And um, as I grew up, um, after some iterations, I said, you know, I want to give back. I want to do something that really, when I go to work every day, it's meaningful. Um, and just by coincidence, I entered into the nonprofit sector. Mm. And therein lies working with a lot of organizations, national organizations and smaller organizations. But my focus really had been on youth for a long time. For people who don't really understand, and I told you before we get on the air that I grew up in the, uh, I grew up in Newark right. in the Broadway right. branch, mm -hmm. the Broadway club. Nobody called it a branch. It's a Broadway club. Right. For a lot of us, it's where we learn how to swim. We learn how to fish. People say we learn how to fish, and it wasn't at the Broadway Club. Right. It was that the Broadway Club would take you fishing. Right, exactly. To some other place because <laughs> there was no fishing there. And it was where a lot of us grew up. Yeah. And I think it's for people who don't know, again, when I grew up, it was the boys' club. Right. But for the boys and girls' clubs, mm -hmm. particularly in urban areas, describe for people who don't know or appreciate it what it does for kids. It's their, it's their home away from home. Sometimes it's more meaningful in some cases for kids than home because it's a safe environment. Mm -hmm. They're getting that attention. They're getting their needs met. Um, the Boys and Girls Clubs have really um, turned into a youth development organization. They're looking at the whole child. So the kids that participate... They're doing the homework there, too. Oh, they're doing homework. We have power hours, mm. homework. We have career launch. I mean, the programs that we're 
um, introducing to the kids are for about life, their life skills, character and leadership development, education and career development. We do health and life skills. So it's really about the whole child and how to bring them in, get the best out of them, show them opportunities, show them what they can do. And they embrace it. They love it. How do you know it? I know it because I hear it from them. Mm -hmm. I see it. I go and I visit all the clubs um, a lot yeah. <laughs> in my position. And I get to meet a lot of the kids. We do an incredible program called the Youth of the Year, where um, we, you know, take the, the kids that have been in the club for a long time and we lift them up and though they're the stories that you hear about how long they've been engaged what That's the right. club has done to them and now they're off and moving on to their post-secondary careers and opportunities and they know that it wouldn't be for the clubs that they wouldn't be able to have done these so things. from an economic perspective people think well okay that's wonderful from a philanthropic point of view mm -hmm. charitable it's really nice that you do that but mm -hmm. it's more than that Excuse me. From an economic perspective, if the boys and girls club were not clubs were not doing this, if these young people were not gaining these life skills, mm -hmm. that really increased the odds that they would become productive citizens. Mm -hmm. What's the alternative for them, and what would be the potential economic impact to society? I think the alternative is really gangs. You know, teenage pregnancy, um, incarceration, incarceration. Um, these kids really need these clubs. It is their, their lifeline for a lot of them. You know, it shows them the way, it shows them a path. Mm. Um, and they really enjoy being a part of it so much that we have a lot of club staff that are former members. That's right. So they really learn how to give out to the community also and come back into their own Boys and Girls By Club By the way, community. while it's not in uh, New Jersey, I know you know this. The most famous club member, uh, you know what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. The most famous club member out of New York, I think out of Westchester, pretty sure out of Westchester. Yes. Who is it? Denzel Washington. He is, right? Yes, yes, yes. Say so he always says yes. it changed his life. He is uh, the epitome of what the Boys and Girls Club can do for, for children and youth. Say, so if it did it for Denzel Washington, it can, do, a, it. It can do it for anyone. anyone. It's a terrific. Uh, yeah. Um, testimonial. Listen, Susan F. Hall, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Boys and Girls Clubs in New Jersey, I want to thank you for joining us and wish you, but more importantly, not just you, but the, the boys and, and the girls, the young men and young women of, of your organization, nothing but the best. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for your support. Our pleasure. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at caucusnj.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. Dr. Richard Robitaille is the Assistant Vice President, Office of Military and Veteran Affairs at Berkeley College. Good to see you, Doctor. Good to see you, Steve. Uh, first of all, what does the office do and who does it do it for? Well, the office, we oversee, my staff and I oversee all the veteran, veteran affairs and military uh, programs for all of our military and veteran students. Uh, How many are we talking about at Berkeley? Over 500 at this point, either in our campuses or online and around the world. It's interesting. You know, this whole question of our veterans and how we treat them, I said to you right before we came on the air, I said, I don't think most of us get it, have any idea what they're facing, what they're dealing with. Do you proactively, does the college proactively go after, recruit these No, these the, veterans, uh, they come to you? What well, happens? no, we don't do recruiting. We do support. Uh, what does that mean? That means when the veterans come to us, veterans, uh, the, you know, they don't know a lot about their benefits. There's no training when they're in the military. In fact, they get maybe a 30-minute briefing from the VA before they From the uh, Veterans Administration? Right. And no one's paying attention because their families are waiting outside and they want to go home. <laughs> uh, they, they worry about their GI Bill and their benefits once they start looking for a school. And then that's where my staff and I come in. We are the experts in that area, and we assist them through that process. Rich, it's interesting you talk about the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. People often say, oh, the GI Bill. They have no idea what that means. The GI Bill, does it include the college piece? The GI Bill, uh, the current Chapter 33 post-9-11 GI Bill, is uh, it's a very lucrative program. 
if they've served uh, three years in the military, they get basically 100% of their tuition and fees covered by the Department of Veteran Affairs. What percent of those who are eligible for the GI Bill on the college side, in terms of 100% of tuition reimbursement, fees, right. actually utilize it? Well, that's always an ongoing problem, and it's been a historical problem with the GI Bill. I don't know the exact percentage, but it's somewhere between 20 and 25% actually use it. That's it? That's it. And this one, they, they think it's going to be a lot higher because they've made it a lot better than the older chapters, like the chapter I went through, because they've added a housing component to it. The idea is, you know, the, the problem of veteran homelessness is, is a plague across America, and that's a symptom of the, mm -hmm. pro the product of veterans who don't have a proper education. So when they built this chapter, the GI Bill, they felt if they can keep that veteran housed, and keep them paying their rent and paying their mortgage, they'll be more likely to finish their college degree, which then in turn will allow them to get a better career and be able to take care of themselves and their families. Your background in the military is? I just started my 25th year in the Army. So I'm a 25th year? 25 years I've served the U.S. Army. I'm in a, currently in the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. Wow. I've also had five years active duty. Spent four years of my life overseas. So. I, you know, was raised by a Vietnam veteran. My grandfather was a World War II veteran. I'm a Desert Storm veteran. And now I like taking care of the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans that are in our colleges today. It's very personal for you on a lot of levels. Absolutely. The, the biggest challenges and obstacles that returning vets face when it comes to the academic experience is? Yeah, this is the piece most people don't understand. You know, most of our veterans are between 24 and 28 years old. That's mm. the new face of the veteran. It's not the, the World War II and Korean veterans that we grew up with that filled our veterans halls. Unfortunately, most of those are passing on now. The majority of our veterans are in their mid-20s, and their peer group that they graduated high school with has passed them by. Um, they're already out of college. They're already in their mom and dad businesses. They're climbing the corporate ladder. Whereas the veteran gave those four to six years of service to the American people. And so they're in their mid-20s. All they have is a high school degree. They uh, have experiences like no other. Um, but they have uh, many barriers. They all get married young, so they have uh, spouses and dependents that uh, rely on them. So they, they have, have to work. barriers? They have many because they have to work. Most of our veterans work full time and go to school full time <laughs> because they have a spouse or kids to take care of. And then you put on top of that, many of our veterans have disabilities, whether they have, uh, were wounded in Iraq or Afghanistan, so they have physical disabilities they have to deal with for the rest of their lives. Uh, a lot of them have emotional issues, loss issues. Uh, some, many have substance abuse issues. And through all of that, they're trying to put themselves through college and catch up with the whole peer group that passed them by. What is it that you and your team at Berkeley do for them to Anything. try to manage that experience? <laughs> I, tell my, I tell my staff that we serve... We don't just answer their questions about the GI Bill. That's really, you know, anyone can do the paperwork and get them processed. But we have a veterans advisor on staff. We have a, a director. We have a coordinator. We serve as a veterans advocate. Uh, sometimes veterans come in, and the problem is they just don't know where to go. They don't know what questions to ask. They're scared. Uh, some of them don't want to use their benefits because it's been ingrained in them, the idea of selfless service. Some feel taking the GI Bill is, goes against what they've been taught, because they've been taught to give, to serve America, to serve our country, and they don't like taking. So the, you know, they have that attitude. So we have to tell them it's all right. We go through all their benefits. Some have injuries, and they, they're afraid to admit it. They don't want to go to the VA. They don't want to file for compensation or disability, because it'll make them feel weak. Some have mental issues, emotional issues, PTSD, and they don't know where to go. Post-traumatic stress syndrome? Yeah, post-traumatic. So you manage all, all that and more. Right, absolutely. We help, we help with landlords. We help with employers. We have a lot of veterans. There's some, they get out of the service, and they don't have a job, and they go to sign a lease. Well, you have to show proof of income. They don't have income other than the GI Bill and their housing payments, so we will interject with that landlord and say they do have income for this period of time and what the money will be. In a few minutes left, I'm curious about something. Most institutions of higher learning do not have something like this. Well, they all have to have one not person. Not to that degree. No, no, not to this degree. And if you don't, i got to ask, what are the consequences of not having such an extensive Well, you'll have veterans that don't feel program. they're supported, that don't feel that there's a, a staff that understands their culture and environment. And it really is. It's its own culture and environment. I understand it thoroughly because I was raised by Vietnam vets, and so I understand that. I'm a veteran myself. So when they talk, when they come with their issues, I understand where they're coming from. I understand what's on the other side, you know. The rest of us, what would you, hmm, what do you think the rest of us should be, I don't want to say expecting from, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. What do you hope the rest of us come to think of these Vietnam vets who are back at school right now? Um, are they Iraq, Afghanistan veterans? Yeah. yeah. 
what should we want for them? Well, they have, they have a set of skills, like we talked about barriers. They also have many strengths. They have years of leadership training, I was management leadership. training, logistical training, supply management Teamwork. training, team development. They have skills that were ingrained in them at a very young age. The military is very good at giving immense responsibility to very young people. You have 19, 20 year olds who are in charge of men and women in combat, who are in charge of millions of, millions of dollars worth of equipment. They can make great successes Absolutely. of themselves. And much of what we do, we will often tell a veteran, tell me what you did in the military, and we'll teach them the civilian terminology for what they did in the military. Dr. Richard Robitaille, Assistant Vice President, Office of Military and Veteran Affairs at Berkeley College. Um, you and your colleagues are doing important work for people who served our country. And I want to thank you, obviously, for the service that you provided our country then and for the service that you continue to provide today. I want to thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Wells Fargo, the law firm of Gibbons PC, PSE&G, Verizon Communications, and by Cone Resnick. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. I work for Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I'm a catastrophic case manager. I'm a nurse. I feel a sense of responsibility to each and every member that I speak with on the phone. I know where they live, I know their towns, I know the hospitals they go to. A lot of times I know their physicians, and um, I love helping people at very difficult times of their lives. The job I have now is the perfect job for me. I think I was born a nurse. <laughs>